and him who reigns with them in highest heaven, the one eternal God, whom earth and heaven adore, for thus it was, is now, and shall be evermore. Scripture lesson today is Genesis 1, 1 through 5, and Genesis 2, 1 through 9. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without shape or form. It was dark over the deep sea, and God's wind swept over the waters. God said, Let there be light, and so light appeared. God saw how good the light was. God separated the light from the darkness. God named the light day and the darkness night. There was evening and there was morning, the first day. The heavens and the earth and all who live in them were completed. On the sixth day, God completed all the work that he had done. And on the seventh day, God rested from all the work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all the work of creation. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. On the day the Lord made earth and sky, before any wild plants appeared on the earth, and before any field crops grew, because the Lord God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth, and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered all the fertile land. The Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land, and blew life's breath into his nostrils. The human came to life. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and put there the human he had formed. In the fertile land, the Lord God grew every beautiful tree with edible fruit, and also he grew the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. sitting there listening like nothing happens next. <laughs> Friends, today we do begin our 2024 journey reading through the Bible and exploring weekly themes a bit more deeply on Sunday. Before we launch into the beginning of the story in Genesis 1 and 2, let's talk a little bit about the why and the how of the year. And one of the first whys of this is that you have expressed a desire to go deeper into the Bible, to grow in connection to God and to God's story. Almost every time I've asked for feedback or ideas over the last three years, this is at the top of the list. And we should expect that. Scripture is foundational to our faith to our understanding of who God is and how we can be in relationship with God and one of the primary ways that God speaks to us. Yet despite that knowledge and our own personal desire, it can be really hard to maintain a regular routine of reading, prayer, and study. How many people read all the days of this week? Not today, well. All of the assigned days, how's that? <laughs> good job, that was a pretty good response. Here's the good news. We'll have 365 chances this year to begin that routine, right? <laughs> and the how, be graceful with yourself. If you didn't read today, read tomorrow. If not this week, then next week. The apostles entreat us to encourage one another and so we shall. Don't let yourself be defeated by a gap. Just plug back in where we are and keep reading. You'll keep absorbing. And the second big why is the idea and the invitation to read the entire Bible without the frustration, 
fear and boredom that we can encounter and that often stops us. And I've hit all those things when I've attempted a cover to cover read in the past. There are, if we're honest, very confusing, contradictory, distressing, disgusting, archaic, and bewildering parts in this 4,500 year old story. And just to note, they're all still there. <laughs> we're still gonna encounter them. But what we hope is that by bringing them into the light, by asking a lot of questions, digging around for some understanding and context, and talking together about what we're discovering, that those things won't be encountered with fear and frustration. We'll just notice how we feel, notice what we think, and then we'll work through it together. While I am committed to this journey and doing the work behind the work each week, I kind of narrowed down the four or five studies that I want to do along with it, the resources I want to use. I'm excited about the opportunity to learn together and to share our own experiences and thoughts. So this week, we'll launch our first Bible study opportunity, Thursday mornings at 11 a.m. We'll start in my office, and if enough people show up, we need more space, we'll move to the library. And we'll talk about the week behind us. So what you've already read, what we've already talked about on Sunday, and the questions and reflections and thoughts and ideas that we've had. Please make space to come and share in the experience. And then my hope is to launch a second Bible study to be held at North Point Woods each week that we may include Ed and Maddie and Margaret and Jean and some of the elders who live there and all of their wisdom. Eventually we'll have an online video conference study as well. So at least three different ways that we can connect ourselves, that we can invite other people to connect as we go through this. This week I launched a new Facebook group called the Bible Year at Christ EUMC, I think. So it's under our page. We talked about that a little bit this morning. And you hopefully saw the intro video that I did on Wednesday. I've never done a year-long church project before. And one of the things I'm finding a blessing is not feeling like everything has to be in place and begin on day one. Like you, there's another chance and another chance and another week. So we'll try things. We'll experiment. We'll figure out what works for us and our faith community. And I welcome your input in this. If we're going to do something for a year, let's do it with our whole hearts. Let's do it as best we can. In all of that, I truly hope you find one study group to plug into. You're also welcome to launch your own. If you have some friends who want to go through this journey with you, gather them together. There's a leader guides I'm happy to share. For the Bible to have its full power unleashed in our lives, which is what we want, what God wants, it needs to be read with other people. Please also considering asking someone to join in, and we've talked about that. Let's talk for a few minutes about the how. A copy of the Bible year in print or ebook will be helpful, but the weekly reading will be in the bulletin each week, and I'll post it on Facebook either Sunday or Monday morning. And generally, it's about four to five chapters every day, about 15 minutes of reading, depending on your reading speed. And make notes as you go in your Bible or your journal. With this pace, it's really easy to look track, lose track of what you thought, what caught your attention, what questions you have. And while my hope is that you found a version of the Bible you want to read or hear this year, keep experimenting. It can be helpful to read or hear a different translation, particularly if something is particularly troublesome. If you're like, what in the world does that mean? Try reading a different translation. And Bible Gateway is a great online resource. They have probably, I don't know, 40 different translations of the Bible. So while you may not own a message Bible, you can hop in there, put in the passage, and read it 
in several different things to see how the translations of, remember, what were original Greek and Hebrew words passed down through millennia <laughs> have reached us. That's a helpful thing to do. Um, and remember to bring your Bible with you on Sundays, my friends. We started talking about that last fall. Um, one of those other habits we can develop across time. We'll have 51 Sundays <laughs> to practice that after today. Because there is a message, a story, a connection in it all that we are meant to discover and understand. And one of my personal hopes in reading through the Old or the Hebrew Testament in particular is being able to recognize the stories, the verses, the names that Jesus uses more easily. The Old Testament is referenced so often in the New Testament. While may, many Bibles cross-reference those, I want them to live in me a bit more deeply. I want the question of where have I heard this word, this phrase, this story before to kind of resonate in my mind both as we read through and then particularly as we enter the New Testament this summer. Encounter the Bible with curiosity, my friends. We kind of come in, we all come in with our own understanding, the knowledge we have, the experience we have. But the Bible can handle your questions. The Word of God can handle your questions, your doubts, your fears, your anger, your sorrow, your joy, and your wonder. One of the phrases I read this week invites us to take the Bible seriously but not literally or dogmatically. In the end, we want the Word of God to speak to us, we want to hear it, and we want to take that seriously as part of our faith, but we understand this is a complex document. If we're saying it speaks to us, it speaks to us in confusing ways <laughs> sometimes. So we keep digging. As you encounter a particular chapter, story, or verse, Consider whether it is one of three things, whether it is prescriptive, telling us exactly how to live in obedience to God. An example of this is love the Lord your God with heart, mind, soul, and strength, taught both by Jesus and by Moses. Whether it's prescriptive to whether it's descriptive, sharing the story of God and God's people the three major stories we encounter this week, creation, Noah, and the Tower of Babel, are all descriptive stories. There's some lessons in there, but it's a narration. Parts of the Bible are that. Or three, whether it's predictive, talking about what might happen, usually if we are not obedient to God, or the people in the story are not obedient, almost an if A, then B kind of thing. We'll certainly hit this when we come to the books of the prophets, but we'll see it again and again. And that may help us as we consider how to connect with the passages. Are they prescriptive, descriptive, or predictive? In all of that, may we remember that the Bible is not a puzzle to be solved. It's not an equation to figure out. It is a mystery to be encountered and revered. Please pray with me. Loving God, we thank you for your word. The word of scripture, the word made flesh in Jesus, the word you continue to offer us through the Holy Spirit. And this year, may we continue to encounter your word in all of its forms in our lives. May you just illumine this path for us. Give us the light that we need in darker places. Give us your joy when we encounter the desert dry places. Give us your understanding when we are confused. Help us see your character when the character we see is not who we imagine or know that you are. In all of this, we trust you to lead us. We trust that you are good and that we will find your goodness in all of your story. 
We give you this in the name of the Father, Son, Spirit, and Word. Amen. Before we start poking at Genesis a bit, some reminders of the big context. The Bible is a story of a particular group of God's people in a particular place and time. Humanity has been cooking along for thousands of years, but it's just transitioning into a time of created civilizations, of metalworking, and written language, just kind of moving from pictographs to some form of writing. The Hebrew people are not alone on the planet, as we'll continually discover they run into other civilizations, other peoples. And it is certainly a story of a particular place, if we can do that next slide, Roger. This slide shows what we might consider the Near East, Egypt, Israel, and Turkey, where most of the Bible takes place. The land of Canaan and Israel and Jesus is a narrow strip of land sandwiched between the Mediterranean Sea to the west and the Arabian Desert to the east. It's an important trading and travel route that tended to draw many kinds of people. It's a very diverse land because of that. And this is a story that formed in an incremental process over a considerable period of time. Like lots of history and stories, it was written decades, even centuries, after the events as the development of writing met the exiled Jewish community. And lastly, it's a story about people. Flawed, imperfect, wonderful, hateful, giving, and selfish people just like us. People living, trying to live in right relationship with God just like us. People trying and failing and trying again just like us. It is there where we'll find ourselves in the scriptures and the scriptures in us. Let's begin. Our first book, Genesis, is one of the five books of the Jewish Torah or the Pentateuch, the core of the Jewish faith, remembering that that faith is followed by Jesus. Jesus was a Jewish man. This is one of the stories he would have heard, that he knew, that he quoted. And the first 14 chapters of Genesis contain some of the best known and culturally referenced stories. Creation. Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, Noah and the Flood, the Tower of Babel. You could ask almost anyone, certainly uh, probably on earth, close to it, what, who Noah was, and they'd have some idea whether they'd ever been in a church or not, just because this language has persisted. These stories have been told in so many ways. And one of the commentaries that I read this week called this particular arc the primeval stories. Stories that were the theological wranglings of how and why we came to be here and where God was and is. Stories that have been passed down in some form orally around cooking and campfires for untold generations. Next week as we look at the call of Abraham on the first generations of the Jewish story, We'll begin to explore the history and the narrative of the Jewish people. These four, first 14 chapters, however, are just the narrative of people as seen through the lens of the Hebrew faith. All cultures have a creation story, a cultural, religious, or traditional story which describes the earliest beginning of the present world. Creation myths are the most common form of myth usually developing first in oral tradition, and they're found throughout human culture. And they're usually regarded as conveying profound truths, as we do in the Genesis stories, although not necessary in a historical or scientific or a literal sense. There are truths there. And there are several creation stories that were floating around during the time of this telling, during this writing, 
in neighboring civilizations of Egypt and Mesopotamia. But this is our creation story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. One of the best known opening lines of any book. And the first two chapters of Genesis, part of which Diane read this morning, are a creation story, or more accurately, two creation stories, or maybe a mashup of two or more creation stories. I find the rhythm of Genesis 1 to be one of the most beautiful pieces of writing that I know, kind of nested meditation with that beautiful repetition on God's creation. On the sixth day in Genesis 1, God created human beings in his own image, male and female. In the image of God, he created them. A couple of thoughts on this fundamental image for you to consider. If humans are created in God's image, male and female, then God must be inherently male and female. The form of God is, of course, one of our enduring underlying questions and a central mystery that we won't solve while we're on this point of existence. Right at the beginning, with an ancient understanding of it all, God is male and female. Not male or female, but male and female. As our understanding of the complexity of gender in contemporary America deepens, I wonder about that and. We all have some male and some female in us, some estrogen and some testosterone, some traits and thoughts and mannerisms of each within us. Just ponder a bit what that means to have that acknowledged at the beginning of it all, that we are all made in God's image, no matter who we are. As we move into Genesis 2, there's a bit more specificity about the how the creation of man and women came to be. And it's right away in this chapter that we encounter our first dissonance or contradiction. Did God create the animals and plants and then humans? Or did God create humans to help name the animals and plants as they were created? So right away, we have these two stories. Regardless, we have arrived. The creation stories continue with God's placement of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. All of it is good, and God is the potter and the builder. Yet this creation is called by God good and not perfect. Think about that for a moment. And God said it was good. And this creation has a fundamental challenge. It has people. People-y people, people whose God has given free will and choice. Adam and Eve have everything they need, and God has told them how to be in relationship with God. Yet temptation, in the form of a serpent, arrives. God has asked them not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, a knowledge that would make them like God. God, like God. Surely, says the serpent, you should know. Knowing is so tasty. Regardless of the instigation and the later blame shifting that happens in the story, they both ate and suddenly knew the things that people weren't supposed to know. And while this is sometimes called the fall, I think it might be more accurately called the choice. In choosing to become like God, they left the most safe and secure and good world imaginable and went into the unknown. Creation called by God good and not perfect has a fundamental challenge. And free people can choose to disobey, to do evil, to sin, and to distance ourselves from God. In this creation story, the choice results in banishment from the garden and the arrival of mortality. Then the story 
continues with their offspring, brothers Cain and Abel, and very human demonstrations of jealousy, anger, and ultimately violence. Cain acts this out as he kills his brother. God has a dialogue with Cain, kind of really demonstrating how deep God will go to reach us, to talk with us, to help us remain in relationship with God. But Cain gets a little sarcastic and defensive. Am I my brother's keeper? Rejecting God's offer of remaining in relationship and is banished east of Eden. That story with people that somehow came from somewhere, which is one of my enduring questions, where did they all come from, continues for ten generations before the time of Noah. Ten generations, albeit long ones, with lifespans numbering 600, 700, 800 years. And it's, then it's only chapter 6, and the world has gone wrong. That was the heading in my Bible for chapter 6, the world gone wrong. I very much love the verse in 6.3 when the Lord says, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. And he reduces our lifespan to 120 years. You sense God is doing a little experimenting as well as we go through this creation. And yet humanity has gone wrong. Everything humanity thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil, it says. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on this earth. It broke his heart. We think of God as being angry in this, but really I think God was heartbroken. It was so good. It was so good. Where did this all go wrong? Has anyone of a parent ever had those kinds of thoughts about their children and their family in the worst of times? Where did this all go wrong? And in the story, God decides to wipe out humanity. There are a lot of do-overs in the Bible. This is a faith of second chances, but most of the chances don't look like this. Noah is right and righteous in God's eyes and tasked with building an ark, saving enough humans and animals to repopulate the earth. And God gives Noah some very specific directions, how many cubits things are, and Noah obeys. That is the lesson of Noah, is the lesson of obedience. Noah is saved, Noah's family is saved, humanity is saved because Noah is obedient to God's seemingly impossible task. The lesson of saying yes, another kind of choice. And there are lots of flood stories in Near Eastern traditions of the time. While the flood may or may not have been worldwide, there is evidence, geologic evidence, that there was a cataclysmic flood before written history. The Noah story is our primeval story about how we came through that. It's a story of how God grieved the evil choices of humans offered a way through, likely grieved the pain of destruction as well, and then said, not again, not doing that again. Genesis 9:12, that we read with Elijah this morning says, then God said, I am giving you a sign of my covenant with you and with all living creature, creatures for all generations to come. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. God has given humanity a chance to start over with a righteous man, brought us through the flood, and unfortunately, it takes until about Tuesday <laughs> before it's all messed up again. Noah is drunk and naked, Ham is cursed, and the cycle of blessing, curse, and redemption has begun once more. So look for that cycle, particularly in this week as we start with Abraham's story. Blessing, curse, and redemption. Our primeval arc ends with the story of the Tower of Babel in chapter 11. I'm going to read this to you. 
At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. And then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches to the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. They won't be able to understand each other. And in that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. And in that way, he scattered them all over the world. So another primeval story about how this array of people came to be out of this one common source that is defined in the creation story. The story of Babel might be summed up this way. There's almost no way to measure the potential of human arrogance and hubris. <laughs> Let's build a tower that reaches God. In the creation story of Adam and Eve, they wanted to be like God and make choices to do so. In the Babel story, the people want to reach God on their own power in their own way, and they make choices to do so. As we consider how these most ancient of stories connect with us, may we consider the power and the impact of our own choices. God walks with us in the garden. Here's one of my questions through the week. What does it sound like when God is walking in the garden? Isn't that cool to think about, <laughs> being in the garden, having God walk with you? Yet God does walk with us and that in the garden song and image is such a strong one for us. Is this what we choose to stay in the garden with God? God creates and loves the good, including you and including me. Can we choose to remain good? Our hope lies in a God who has said there will be second chances. They will come without flood, without violence, without death. Let me show you the way. And so for the rest of the year, we'll con continue to find that way that God gave God's people. Ten more generations follow when Noah and his descendants spread through the region and create nations. All the nations of the earth descended from these clans after the great flood. And one of these descendants is Abram, became Abraham, became father of the nations. Next week, we'll join him in his family story. And just a note as we do that, this week we read days one through seven, and I kind of noticed that's a little out of sync <laughs> with how our Sundays are going to hit. So really, we should have read days one through five. So if you went all the way through seven, you got, you've got read a couple. So just look at the way the Bible year um, is laid out. So we'd be reading, what, six through 13. Um, your bulletin is a little wrong. You'll stop a couple chapters short. Um, but, you know, you'll get there eventually. So if you read all the chapters, that's okay, too. So all that being said, my friends, please pray with me as we get ready to close our worship for today. Loving God, we thank you for these primeval stories, for our origin stories. In them, we can see you creating this good world, creating people intended to live in relationship with you, to be good, to do good, to receive your good love all the time. And we see the choices that are made. May we recognize the power of our own choices in every day. May we just seek to follow you more closely, that you will find our choices good, 
And may we seek to follow you more closely that we know that we are forgiven when they are not. And all this we just give you prayer and praise and gratitude. Amen.